influence the, the rheostat with the cortex. And what's that called? It's biofeedback. You, you do positive, thing, positive reinforcement for good behaviors, and you shut it down, or you uh, do negative reinforcement. I mean, I guess we don't really do that. We just do all positive and biofeedback where, you know, this is good, the bar is coming down, the relaxation is happening, the imagery is working, the self-hypnosis is, uh, is getting us somewhere. Um, uh, you know, versus, you know, which we give them an electric shock if they do bad things. We, we don't do that any, anymore where we do the negative and the positive. But clearly we can, we can do positively reinforcing things to reset the rheostat away from these chronic changes, perhaps all the way back to normal. All right, that's enough. I think you're first. First of all, thank you very much. I just like to take one minute. Thank Dr. Cooper for inviting me. It's a great opportunity to learn about RSD. This is totally new to me, and I had a great chance to meet uh, many of the professionals in the field, but also many of the patients who are suffering the pain. And I thank you all for, uh, for this opportunity. Is it on? OK. Uh, the second, I want to also thank you very much for this brief presentation, and uh, thank uh, Vanya Apkerian, who inspired my early work on uh, on visceral pain. I have great admiration for the team up there. And uh, also on the rheostat thing, I like to follow up and pick up something with you on there. I happen to believe that things are not linear in the brain. So for us to say that there are positive and negative things on two ends of the spectrum is a bit of a simplification, not to say misrepresentation of what's truly happening. Pain can be rewarding and a source of happiness for many in as much as sex and food can be a source of sadness for others. So this rheostat there, this linearity that is, uh, is coming down or our perception of this linearity may not be quite accurate. The feed forward system that you're talking about in terms of reward exists also at the level of pain control. We have feed forward loop that can further the pain, mechanistically speaking, and can also sometimes dampen the pain, mechanistically speaking also. These switch in chronic pain conditions. So whatever is dampening your pain can shift from a break to an accelerator and can give you more pain. This is something we've struggled with for a long time, and I hate to see you repeat the same thing with this other system here. So we need a bit more of an open-mindedness in the field and try to consider other things than just our own uh, you know, conception uh, of the world. I, I don't mean that, but we're supposed to be really facing each other. And I, I jumped in the, in the circle first because I have to leave early, so. <laughs> I, I, well, I get to respond, right? Well, I, you know, and I agree with you. When I talked about things that were negative or positive, this is just me. This is what I think are negative and what I think would be positive. I'm trying to put myself in the head of a chronic patient. You know, what would, what, and, and maybe if I was there, it would be totally different. But, but I'll, I'll use the, the very graphic example, and Sean Mackey is actually studying this, of, uh, of the uh, uh, masochist, who pain is good, pain is fun, pain is, is, is related to sexual uh, gratification. So, so you're absolutely right. You know, what is, what is bad for me may be good for someone else, and this may change over time. So, you know, it's, it's more like an analog response than it is like, a, 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 you know, an off or on or a dichotomous response. So, so I, I agree with you absolutely. I, I, I simply was just trying to portray the possibility of, of you know, some place that we can influence now with, with all that rehab stuff. So I got back to rehab. We can go back to uh, uh, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. Uh, in relaxation, stress management, imagery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, which influence this thing, I think, in a positive way in most people, but not all. And clearly, we can't help everybody with rehab. I just want to make one more point, I think, that needs to be driven, and this is, has come across throughout this meeting, and it is the individuality of the experience. It's very important for us not to generalize. If we make an observation in animals at the first stage or preclinically, and we do it in a very controlled environment, it does not mean that this is the case in the clinical world. If we make an observation on a subset of patients, a clearly selected group of patients, and we see an area that has lit up, 
it does not necessarily mean that the same thing will be seen in many other patients. Each of us, although we like to think of us as very similar, are different. We experience things differently. We perceive things differently. So pain for each one of us is a different experience. And this would be reflected, I like to believe, somewhere in our brains. So in as much as I like to uh, give deference to the imaging and uh, really hats off to all the work that's been done in enlightening us about the function of the brain, I think we have to keep room there uh, to the fact that we may not all look alike on these images. So the nucleus accumbens may light up in a few people, but may not in others. And what may be rewarding for you, <laughs> what may be rewarding for you may be punishing for me. So I just... Well, and, and, and again, I agree. Um, because, you know, as, as researcher, we have to generalize. That's what research is. You have to take large populations and, and extract averages, okay? And that's what statistics is all about. However... There's a lot of argument for what I call the end of one experience, which is the sacrosanct relationship between doctor and patient. And the informed patient portrays symptoms to the doctor. The doctor, hopefully being informed, you know, considers all of that and makes a un unfettered, unencumbered decision, not encumbered by guidelines or, or algorithms or, or HMOs. They make an unencumbered, unfettered decision about what is best for that patient in that intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship. And it may, you know, it may be completely different from the next patient that comes in the room. This is medicine. This is why it's an art and not a science. But we also have to talk about science. We have to get those generalities so that we can say, hmm, in 72.3% of the patients, this happens and this works. We need that as a touch zone so we can become that informed practitioner and make informed decisions. All right? Okay. I may be allowed one more point on that particular thing, this stat the role of statistics and how misleading that could be. Uh, I agree with you that we need to make informed decisions. The generalizations sometimes do not lead us there because generalizations are masking those cluster differences between us. If we manage to redesign our stats, and here I'm talking science, I'm not talking art anymore, to highlight those differences, to highlight those different groups within the RSD population or within the functional disorders uh, uh, population that may respond differently to treatment or may exhibit different manifestations of symptoms, of pathology, or if there is any pathology, or of brain activity then we would get a better and more informed uh, decision, and that would inform our approach far better than saying I have 80% respondents, and in that 80%, actually, some of them responded at the zero end, and some of them at the 80% end, and the overall response is simply 10% above placebo. This is what the reality of the uh, medical approach, or if you want, the pharma-driven approach today to pain is. It's really not very much above placebo. And if you look at the distribution range between the efficacy of a drug and the efficacy of a placebo, they're overlapping. The overlap is huge. We mask it by the statistics. We need to start, pass it out, look at the differences and cluster them, phenotype them, and proceed from there. We can better understand them that way. We can see the mechanisms better and perhaps advance the field uh, faster than what we're doing or what we've been doing for the last First of all, I want to thank you for your talk. Number two, I was a collegiate wrestler, and Samoan, a Samoan circle is where you wrestle till there's only one guy standing. So I'm, I'm sorry, I thought this was something else. <laughs> and since I come from New York and you come from Chicago, I'm looking forward to this. It should be fun. No, but your work is really, really, really good. You know, if, there's the old adage that says if you hang around in science long enough, you'll either be proven a hero or a heel. Um, I'm, I don't know where this next comment's going to get me, so I'll let you be the decision. Um, back when I was in graduate school, the, the group that we were working with was Gordon Barr and Fernando Pasik and Nita Goodless. And we had done the work on the accumbens, looking at the accumbens primarily in pain. So it's been around for a long time, because it's been 30 years since I've been in graduate school. So that's the antique part. Uh, let me just, perhaps I'm more of a gearhead than an electronic guy, and that's going to make Mara cringe. So let me ask you to perhaps consider maybe another analogy instead of, of rheostat. 
think instead of a drivetrain, okay? Um, we saw the accumbens as more like a clutch that could be put in and let out. You have to push that clutch in to shift gears towards a variety of different levels of activity, and then you have to let it out. And you can let it out all the way or not all the way. The accumbens is also, it's very heterogeneous in terms of its anatomy and its neurochemistry. And the other thing that we had shown, this is older literature, is that it's very, very plastic, both during development and interesting, which then speaks to your point, in adulthood. And it's heterogeneous in its neurochemistry in that it receives a very strong dopaminergic input, part of the gear shift, a very strong serotonergic input from the nucleus coming up from the B3 group, the amino forebrain bundle, rich opioids, and GABA. It also links back to the habenula and to the insula. So those connectivities allow it to really work well as a clutch. But what you find is that you also see the plasticity is that one area of the accumbens may be more responsive than others based upon how that particular organism is environmentally encultured or trained operantly. So your, your operant analogy is perfect. It's spot on. The issue with the pain thing is very, very important because, again, it really depends on the nature of the convergent inputs on the accumbens to determine is the accumbens, which is now used for behavioral activation, driving the individual away from the pain, which then produces a strong dopaminergic feedback and opioid reward, or is there something about that pain that may in fact be reinforcing unto itself in terms of primary, secondary, tertiary gain, in which case you'd also see accumbens activation. So your analogy works great, and the, the only comment I had was that perhaps the, the analogy more of keeping it up and down as a rheostat or thinking more of as a clutch, I think would work well. But there is some literature to suggest that it's been around for a while, and I just commend you on sort of revivifying that. So. Wait. Uh, what? Oh, you got it now? <laughs> no, it goes too far. <laughs> you, you, you're, yeah, you're. <laughs> and I, I would invite others. Okay, Peter, my, my question was going to be directed to, uh, to Norm and L.A., so, so, okay. So Norm's focus on the nucleus accumbens. We've been talking about the patient, the reward system about the patient. I'd like to shift the, to the reward system about the pain practitioner. Okay. Why are you why are you all doing this? Why do you wish to relieve pain in others? And on the other side of the the equation, there, what are what are the fears, and the sadness, <clears throat> and the frustrations? that go with being a pain practitioner. Why, why do you order an MRI or a CAT scan or a PET scan? What's your motivation? And is that so that you feel more secure in your actions? And if you don't have the technologies that to make those decisions, do you suffer fear, anxiety, and sadness? Are you seeking these images to help the patient get compensation? And do you feel sadness and anxiety when you can't find compensation for the patient? So I'll give that to you, Peter. Wow, what a question. Um, it may or may not be true that all of us do what we do to reconcile ourselves to our own characters. I'll leave that comment to speak for itself. Um, as a lot of people in this room know, um, I do what I do be in, an, in an effort to understand the experience of my patients, not just what it is that they have that evokes that experience, but what it, what it is like to be in pain and what the experience of pain does to the quality of life and the experience of being human in a culture, in a society, 
in a family, in a personal, um, occupational, recreational, spiritual context. Um, it is that meaning for the person of what it is like to be in pain that I think drives all of us to understand what we seek to understand. Um, I think I may just, just add to that and to the discussion previously. Now, mind you, I'm really hoping that someone is going to step be behind me because in 10 minutes I have to leave, so I can't be here forever. Um, by the way, the last time I stepped to in some kind of a Samoan circle was in Rotorua, which is in uh, um, in uh, New Zealand, and um, there came some big uh, Maori guy came charging at me with this bat sticking out his tongue and insulting me in ways I couldn't comprehend. So, um, of course, fear, the whole process came in, but also some excitement because I thought, well, you're probably underestimating me, uh, me because I'm little. And um, the street guy came up, maybe I can have you. So some excitement as well. So I think that relates to the things you are saying is that every patient is an individual and we don't all react in the same manner as a response to pain and fear and whatever tra threatens us. So what we need to do maybe, and maybe imaging can play a role in that, not just look at the processes which are occurring. Um, take Glia, uh, you show, show fabulous things with regard to what's happened if um, a laser is, is, is uh, a lesion is, is, uh, is administered and all these glia cell go there in, in, in this area. I think it's supposed to do that. And I think inflammation, central sensitization, it's there for a reason. And what we need to go and look at is go back to the patient and start look at why these processes become pathological or go into the wrong direction in these individual patients or why it does persist. So I think, and that's where Candy probably comes in, I hope Candy's now standing up, going to stand out <laughs> behind me. <laughs> I got you there now. <laughs> um, that we need to go and look at predictors for actual chronification of pain, and those are individually based. We have, we need larger samples. We need collaboration, and maybe that's something where an international collaboration could lead to and help each other out. And um, on that bombshell, I would like to stand up and. Um, that's fascinating. I'll just introduce myself very quickly. I'm Elliot Crane. I'm a pediatric pain management doc, and I work at Stanford. So I take care of primarily, well, children, but most of the pain population in the clinic are teenagers. And we have a very large CRPS population. And I ask myself this question all the time, Peter, what the hell am I doing? I, why am I doing this? And I don't know the answer. I got into this initially because I saw a need. There, you know, it was, pain was a huge unmet problem in, in pediatric medicine, particularly in all of medicine generally, and I thought I had something to contribute. Why I continue to do this, I don't really know. I feel like a rat in a Skinner box most of the days. You know, in, in Skinnerian psychology, the most powerfully reinforcing uh, event is, is, is the random reward for behavior. So when, when the rats are rewarded with every push of the lever, that's one thing, but if they were rewarded every fifth or every ninth and then every 20th and then every fifth push of the lever, that behavior becomes much more established. And that's what working in the pain clinic is like in the pediatric world. Every now and then we hit a home run, and that sustains me over the next five or 20 or 30 patients with whom we struggle with these tools. As, as Mark asked uh, earlier, you know, why do we order MRs and CT scans and and, uh, and, and why do we use the drugs that we've used for, in the case of opiates, 2,000 years, in the case of some of the newer drugs for 30 or 40 or 50 years? They're not really very new drugs. They're just new variations on old drugs. And the reason is because, you know, as they say, when your only tool is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. And that's what we've got. And it's a very frustrating field. So this is an exciting meeting for me because, because at the, you know, there's the first inkling I've had um, uh, in a long time that, that we're on the threshold of something, perhaps. 
perhaps. There's a lot of evangelical thought going on this weekend here. Um, and, and so I think Roberto's comments a second ago are, are really also um, very accurate. And Dr. Saab's comments last night that, that w- we need to distinguish the difference between correlation and causation. I think that's extremely important. Um, and that is reflected in what Roberto just said now. So we see these glial cells activated. We see neuroinflammation uh, with CRPS, but we see it with almost every other pathological problem in the nervous system, as we've heard from HIV infections to Alzheimer's disease to stroke, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a generic process, and it's there, as Roberto said, for a, a teleological reason. Um, but once in a while, in some individuals, it goes haywire and it causes suffering. And why it is that it happens in some people but not in most is the million-dollar question because I think that's the key to the realm in terms of therapy. There's some interesting um, evidence in the CRPS world that, you know, we've all seen, as Candy said, fortunately 80 or 85% of of the patients get better. In the pediatric world, it's even a higher percentage, fortunately. But we see these patients, 5 to 10%, who go on with disseminated or multifocal disease. It spreads proximally, crosses midlines, and you have these horrible patients you see once in a while with these what they call total body CRPS, and they're devastated. And there seems to be a genetic basis for that. There's some, there, you know, there's uh, DNA analysis of these patients show there's three or four loci that they have in common. So there's some you know, genetic programming to determine why they have this really badass form of of CRPS, and there's probably some genetic basis for why people get CRPS at all, but most of us don't after trivial nerve injuries. So I don't. I, don't, uh, I, I think it's really Im- important um, from the pediatric perspective. The last comment I want to make is this: is that CRPS and many or most other forms of neuropathic pain don't exist below a certain age. Ten years of age would be a reasonable cutoff. We just we don't see three-year-olds with CRPS. Never ever. Um, and we start to see it when kids are 10 or 11, and then it becomes pretty common when they're 14, 15, or 16. So there's some biological switch that's occurring in the, in the, in the central nervous system or in the immunological system or both. Uh, it might be hormonal in nature. It might not be. But there's some switch that's occurring at around the age of 10, which is when puberty begins to occur. Um, and it's interesting. because I, I was thinking about this also. On the first day, which I guess was Thursday afternoon, there was a woman who made some impromptu comments who was from um, a foundation or an organization that dealt with multiple inf- forms of inflammatory diseases. And I don't remember what her name was. Um, and, and I was thinking, you know, lupus doesn't occur before that age. And rheumatoid arthritis, except for the specific forms of JRA, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which is a different disease than adult rheumatoid arthritis, but the adult forms of rheumatoid arthritis don't occur before a certain age. So there's some biological switch that's occurring. And, and, um, and I'm only throwing this out because I'm the only person here with a pediatric orientation. It's probably something that most of you haven't thought about. But as you begin to look at the neurobiology of pain and specifically neuropathic pain, think about what might be happening and change your... I, might, I hope I can encourage some of the scientists here to, to, to change your focus a little bit and start to zoom in on that population of patients who are, who are 14 or 13 or 12 and ask yourself, why, what's happening at that age? Because something's happening that's leading to this predisposition for patients who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and beyond to get terrible neuropathic pain syndromes. And now I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to change topics a little bit. Uh, I'll introduce myself as well. I'm Srinivasa Raja from Johns Hopkins, and I've worn both hats that of a basic scientist and as a clinician researcher. So I'm, I've been introspecting over the last two and a half days, why are we here, what are we trying to achieve? Uh, and I think the overall goal is to understand the role of neuroinflammation as a mechanism of chronic pain and how neuroimaging can help um, in this process. Uh, so, um, you know, as a uh, researcher, most of you would agree that what's most uh, gra- intellectually stimulating and gratifying is when something that we uh, discover, find, can get translated into better clinical care. 
And, uh, and so in this respect, you know, thinking about what we have learned in terms of advances in neuroimaging during the last couple of days, you know, where is this going? And what is the likely advances in terms of clinical care? I think clearly one aspect where there could be some potential uh, immediate applicability in the near future, at least, is in the diagnosis of chronic pain states, such as CRPS and other neuropathic pain states. Um, however, uh, like we've learned over the last years, um, in terms of number of putative transmitters that we've identified and the failure of these in the clinical world, we have to take a cautious approach in making this jump from what uh, works in rodents uh, to humans. Unfortunately, humans don't seem to behave like rodents in a, in a lot of respects. Uh, and so what I would suggest is that, you know, what we need is sensitive, specific tools, but we have to be cautious to make sure that the diagnostic tools, the neuroimaging tools that we identify, can be the sensitivity and specificity of these tools can be well defined. Uh, and the importance of this is uh, uh, twofold. One, uh, and this is very uh, particularly challenging for CRPS because you know, what do we compare this against? What is the gold standard? And the gold standard for CRPS right now is uh, a, a series of or clusters of signs and symptoms. So we have to compare this new tool against a quote unquote a soft uh, diagnostic uh, gold standard. And the potential downside is you may develop a neuroimaging tool that the insurance company will use as a gold standard now, and patients who may not fit this criteria may then be refused care because they don't fit this diagnostic tool based on this neuroimaging. So a little bit of caution in how we take these neuroimaging into the clinic is, is what I would like to suggest uh, as we go along. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to the to the problems of the variability in CRPS in terms of within an individual and the problems of trying to keep a tab on a very neuroplastic brain while we follow people through. And I'm just aware that I'm, I'm doing a, a multimodal study and I wanted to see the reproducibility of the data. And so we see people at point one and then we see them three weeks later. And I sort of tried to convince myself that actually this would give us an idea of the reproducibility of the data. But then for those with CRPS in the audience, they'll be very aware that during the course of 24 hours, their symptoms change. And of course, the neuroplasticity will change within that 24 hours. And so I would say that actually what we need to do much more is just actually just follow what the normal natural course of this condition is within much shorter time frames to just find out, okay, what does happen over 24 hours? What does this look like? So, um, because I, I have worries about all our neuroimaging stuff, that actually we're not dealing with a linear disease in any concept, that even within a day it doesn't naturally progress to, to peaks in the evening or you know, rather like um, rheumatoid arthritis where you have a very natural pattern. We don't have a natural pattern in CRPS within an hour, within a day, certainly within the lifetime of somebody. And, and I think that's a big challenge for us to say that globally this is how people look over time. I suppose my other comment in relation to that is just as you're saying you don't see very young people, we don't see very old people in clinic either. And I've yet to be referred to somebody who has had uh, either a, a late onset of CRPS sort of in old age or indeed somebody who's had CRPS undiagnosed for many years and, and just not come to the clinic. And I don't know whether other comorbidities overtake and therefore they, they go to different specialties. But it's very interesting for us that we are a national referral centre and we just don't see that very elderly group either. So, Find a way to get together through the Knowledge Consortium or some other vehicle, some other venue, to select a set of um, data points for our study of the natural history in the short course, I'm involved in the long course natural history study, but the short course, um, a, a set of demographic instruments that are uniform and that everyone in this room 
will take back to his clinic to use, a set of diagnostic criteria that everyone will share, and we'll refine those as best we can. Then we can apply the, the new imaging techniques to compare them to that data. We need um, a set of instruments to understand the phenomena of grief and its companion depression and fear and its companion anxiety. Um, we need instruments that we can all agree upon to understand the functional capacities versus disabilities, the experience of each study subject, if you'll excuse me for using that technical term, each person, um, and then the outcome measures. We all have to share the outcome measures uniformly because if we study our clinics population, our, sa our sample, our cohort, with different demographic instruments, with different diagnostic tools, with different um, assessment tools of in for enrollment and outcome, then we're going to wind up with data we can't interpret. It will, it will lack meaning. So we first have to share the instruments to study the disease and the people who have it, and then we can manipulate those populations, divide them, stratify them, and try and find the diagnostic tools and the therapeutic tools to make their lives better. I think I, I couldn't agree with you more, Peter. And I think we have to learn a little bit from our European colleagues. They've done a considerably better job of setting up networks, you know, two good examples are the German Pain Research Network, which has done a, a great job of getting a whole set of investigators to do quantitative sensory testing and phenotype their patients. Another ex excellent example is the London Consortium, which is a, a group uh, not just in UK, but in Denmark and Germany, uh, and it's funded by uh, federal funds, uh, the um, uh, as well as industry, uh, and uh, so it comes from the European Union as well as some industry support. I think Burroughs, Wel the Welcome Trust was part of this as well. And they are talking about an annual budget of about 10 to $15 million across institutions. So I think in the United States, we don't have a similar uh, funding support system. And what we need is to bring the kind of uh, collaborative research that you're talking about. We need this collaboration between uh, the federal government, the industry, and other funding agencies to create projects like this. And just to add on, uh, uh, I have to take a flight as well, and maybe I would invite one of the uh, um, uh, imagers to respond just to say, where do you think the Im neuroimaging needs to go so that I can be replaced? Uh, before it can become part of day-to-day uh, um, -day clinical practice in either diagnosis or developing new therapeutic or targets or uh, therapies uh, uh, in the future. I, I guess as a clinician, I'm desperate that we can do one neuroimaging study that gives us data that we're confident about that then we can then just replicate those studies in clinic without having to constantly go back to neuroimaging. Um, uh, the biggest challenge with neuroimaging is just the, the cost of it, uh, the practicalities of moving patients who have chronic pain to scanners that are actually not terribly compatible with lying still for very long. Um, so uh, as a clinician, I'd love it that the neuroimaging is done for, for key studies that is then very easy translatable to clinical research, to clinical practice that we can just use routinely in our clinics without requiring expensive bits of kit to justify our treatments, really. I'm going to hopefully speak for some of the imagers here. But I'm also inviting the other imagers to come up here. But, um, you know, I got some really excellent questions after my talk yesterday, and uh, it had me thinking, and I, and I kind of wish I answered it uh, as I'm going to speak now. <clears throat> so I never thought what I am doing is going to be the answer. 
but at least it's going to be better than what we have. So if I can develop an imaging modality that would happen to help identify 80% of our current CRPS population, that's 80% of better than what we're doing today, right? We are going to miss maybe 20, 25% of these patients without neuro, I mean, with neuroimaging, no matter which modality we end up developing. But now we can empower that patient with an imaging study. That's my hope. You know, if we can, let's say, use a TSPO radio ligand that would now identify all this glial activation, combine that with their, the history of the patient, the clinical manifestation, you know, excellent clinical workup of this patient, combining that with the imaging, now you've empowered that patient, and now that patient can say, hey, I have CRPS. The doctor now can say, oh, you have CRPS, let's get you to a specialist. And even if we did that in half of the patients, I think that's powerful. And so I agree, we have to move forward carefully, and I'm sure there's, no, there's not going to be one imaging test that would be 100% accurate. But we're doing much, you know, to do much better than we're doing today, I think would speak, uh, you know, eons for this group of people, so. We've identified two areas. One is to um, uh, try and uh, find a set of uh, data points that we can all share. We're a little bit behind the eight ball on that. The ECHO project uh, has its own um, enrollment and outcomes data set. Um, the trend group has its uh, set. Um, the uh, German consortium has another set. Um, uh, are they translatable from one language to another? How can we cooperate with uh, the Lupus Foundation, the Arthritis Foundation, the Diabetes Foundation, um, uh, the Parkinson's disease uh, organizations, so that we can share data sets um, and compare uh, our information across uh, disease and specialty lines. That's very hard to do. I'm, I don't have a good answer for that. The second is to choose some imaging studies that seem promising for some initial pilot tests and some pilot experiments in a highly selected um, cohort of RSDers or uh, dystonic patients, um, whatever the, the, the group we choose. Um, we want to get on the ground with something that we can start a test. Does that mean we have to develop more radio ligands? We thought we're coming into this uh, uh, program that nanobodies uh, looked like a really juicy target uh, finder for us, and now we know that it's 600,000 euros, not dollars, per, per nanobody and six months to immunize the camel, and um, oh, good grief. We'll never get started. Um, maybe there's something out there that we can tap right now. Um, I just needed to address some of the, uh, the points that I've heard here. And I think that one of the, the focuses of this meeting was to undoubtedly try to illustrate where we could be in terms of imaging, the different kinds of imaging, imaging modalities that... Um, are emerging as possible tools to identify what is now becoming an underlying mechanism for a number of CNS pathologies, which is neuroimmune processing. And um, I think what's important here from my perspective is to have first this fundamental, first just to show indeed this does occur over or across a number of different disease states. Here is a perfect example where, um, um, you know, chronic pain conditions and um, complex regional pain syndrome is so difficult to treat in the later stages. I found that some of the data that you were talking about earlier where a CRPS person in the beginning is very different than one later on and I think it would be exceptional to be able to tap into what those differences could be through an imaging modality. Um, 
So that brings me to the next point, which is that I'm a basic scientist. I'm not a clinician. One of the things that we do as basic scientists is we grow up in our labs thinking about rats and how to design experiments. We don't talk to clinicians unless we go to meetings like this. And I think what's starting to develop, what I'm aware of here in this country, is that now we're finally getting to the point where we really need to cross-fertilize our thinking. We need to talk to clinicians on a regular basis. We need to understand what the real world issues are. So that's happening. That's why I wanted to bring in some of what was happening at UNM in terms of bringing together the clinicians and the basic scientists and how we're plugging into a national network. Uh, these clinical translational science award centers are critical in helping to facilitate uh, being able to communicate to people in Boston or in La Jolla, California about uh, who's what is your patient population? How can we access that information? How can we bring that to some of the expert, the imaging modality expertise that's occurring at UNM, which is just one center? But I don't think if that information isn't disseminated, no one's going to know. And I think that's what's been going on for a very long time now. Is and In fact, some of my colleagues have come up to me and said, I had no idea that ECHO, Project ECHO, was going on. How fantastic is that? And, um, and then, of course, I've spoken, I have other colleagues in the College of Engineering and Nuclear Physics. They do fantastic stuff, stuff that I see, I envision, as being maybe part of a, of a, of a method to be able to employ uh, for use to, of diagnostics. So to think in the future. And then lastly, um, I just wanted to address this idea that, um, you know, while we don't want to just rely on a particular modality to identify as an identifier for somebody who has CRPS or chronic neuropathic pain or whatever, but again, what I was hearing earlier about the compensation issues is that I feel like we, we are, are locked into a, a, you know, a path in which we have to ensure how do you prevent people who have spent year or went through 42 physicians before she was finally appropriately diagnosed. And I think perhaps having something um, like an imaging modality would further, um, help delineate what that di the appropriate diagnosis would be. So um, I think I'll stop there. So I'm not an imager. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I am a patient. And um, being here this weekend has been really inspiring and has been amazing to see all of the work that everybody's done, you know, on behalf of pain patients without having met them or understanding the, you know, the physical, for lack of a better word, pain that they go through on a daily basis. And, you know, on Aaron's point, I think the first step and is education. And I, you know, it took Barbie 42 physicians to get diagnosed. And I learned that thermography was a diagnostic tool for CRPS that I had, I never was put under a thermographer. I mean, I was never tested for that. I took the word of my doctor and yes, I trusted him, but you know, you're, you're going in blind, you're going in scared and you see a doctor that then tells you, Oh, your knees are colored because you have this chronic pain disease. And, you know, your life kind of flashes before your eyes. And you're like, well, what do you mean I have a, a chronic pain disease? What does, that, what does that even mean? Am I going to get better? Is there going to be a cure? How do I know that what you're telling me is true? I mean, I didn't listen to my doctor. He put me on some medicine and I go, oh, I don't think that I have this. I don't really believe you. Um, this is, you know, I, I'm 23. I can't have chronic pain. That's, that's not an acceptable diagnosis diagnosis for me. It's not. So I ignored him. And then sure enough, I had a full body flare up in the middle of a movie theater. I thought I was going to die. Call my parents, said goodbye, thought that was it. It's going to be in a flare up. And it sounds dramatic, but it was, you know, everything hurt. 
and it sucked. And so I went and I, you know, did my thing and, you know, used all of the medicine that was provided to me. And that's very limited in the world of CRPS. You have very limited options when it comes to medicine. Luckily, I was diagnosed by my first doctor because my surgeon suspected that I had CRPS after my surgery. So I went to one doctor and then I said, well, I would like to get a second opinion. Who do you go to? Who do you get a second opinion from? There's not enough clinicians that are aware about CRPS that can diagnose you. Maybe in this room, yes, but around the country, no. And so while we're all here, and thankfully I'm in remission, so it's not you know all sad sallies, but I mean, I'm in remission, which is terrific. And whatever remission may be, as Candy pointed out, is what I'm in. My flare-ups, my myoclonic spasms, which I get from flare-ups, I haven't had one in over a year. Um, that's thanks to the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which got me where I am. I take no medicine. I work out daily. I run. I swim. I do whatever, you know, I can do. You know, I don't play soccer anymore because, you know, I don't, my, my knees are precious, so I don't want anybody <laughs> to come touching me. But while I see, you know, all of these tools for the future and what, you know, what we have and, you know, what can be. It's, it's amazing. And, you know, I've told a few of the scientists here, I think I almost failed biology in high school. So a lot of this stuff is just way over my head. I just really just don't get it. But I see glia cells, I see there's pain, and then I see them attacking that. So that's really cool to see that. For me, that's cool. I don't play with rats. I don't play with mice. I don't even like them. I live in New York. There's enough rats. I don't want them near me. So... <laughs> Um, but I, I do want to thank everybody for, for being here, but my hope, and like Candy said, I have a kind of a different perspective having had RSD for five years now. I don't see myself as ever being pain free. I see myself as being able to live my life the way I want to with the pain that I have and adjusting what my expectations are because of what I have. And yes, that may be a little depressing, but it is what it is, and it's a fact of life. So you deal with it and you move on. At least I do. But I, what I hope is that it doesn't take people to come around for a special event like this to then communicate with the people in their labs, communicate with the clinicians that they have access to, and the clinicians to teach their students and to teach medical students, what RSD is, and that there's more than just one sentence in a textbook that explains a chronic pain disease. And that's, I mean, I think that the future is, it holds a lot, but I don't know when it will become a reality. But right now the reality is what we know and what we, all of our minds, and to be able to communicate that knowledge to everybody else and spread the information on a, you know, on an actual basis, on a now basis. And I think for us as patients, while the work is amazing, it's not necessarily answering the here and now, which is what we all have to deal with. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, thank you very much and for some of the other patients who are here for sharing with us what's uh, very personal to you. And it, it makes a huge impact on those of us that aren't MDs and don't see patients regularly, we sometimes do see patients uh, in our collaborations with clinicians, but we don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis. So it, it's really important to keep it real for us. So, so thank you. Um, so I just want to get back to, to what Aaron was talking about and what Raj was talking about in terms of uh, imaging as a diagnostic tool. And it would probably surprise people who see me as an imager to come out very negative against imaging, actually. Um, but I'm actually an electrophysiologist by training. So I, I see the imaging data from a different perspective because of that electrophysiology background. Um, so I see it as the blobology of what it is because of the resolution um, of imaging. And so I, I think um, we need to be very careful about putting too much hope into the potential for using certain kinds of imaging as diagnostic tools. 
So standard bold uh, fMRI uh, that is the cheapest, um, most readily uh, and easily accessible thing for people to do without a whole lot of training, um, I, I, I really feel strongly is not going to help us in a diagnostic fashion. It will help us understand the science behind what's going on, but it, I don't think it will ever be a diagnostic tool. And the reason for that is it's scanner dependent. The maps that you, beautiful pictures you see are statistical maps made by setting arbitrary thresholds that we, there's no gold standard, we argue about this stuff all the time. They're, they're prettiest when they're derived from large groups and they're ugliest when they're derived from individual patients. So